You know, if you're driving along and law enforcement vehicle comes up behind you, turns on its lights, you know that someone is in trouble, right? Could be that the officer's heading to an accident or a crime scene, but it could also be that the officer wants to talk to you, right? And you know, at least in my experience, they never pull you over to tell you how good your driving is, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. I mean, you might have been speeding, you might have failed to come to a complete stop at a stop sign or something. And, uh, and so the officer might just give you a warning, but more than likely you'll be given a ticket, you'll be charged with violating the law, and you'll be fined as a punishment, right? And so just think about it for a moment. In our society, our relationship to the law is generally negative. The way it works, if you're caught breaking the rules, you're, you're punished, right? There's no reward for obedience. Our legal code uses fear to deter people from doing things that harm or endanger others. But I hope that you've picked up, as we've been looking at the Old Testament law that the Lord gave to Israel, that it, it's an entirely different mindset from the way that we think about law in our society. Right now, as we've studied the Ten Commandments and in the section that follows, that's often called the Book of the Covenant, we've seen that God did require some punishments for certain violations. Those who committed murder were to be executed, as were those who cursed their parents or kidnapped someone or sacrificed to a false god. Someone stole something, they were to restore what they had taken and then to provide extra, in a way, sort of as a fine. But we've also seen that by setting these limitations uh, of his commandments, the Lord was revealing his character. Right? He, was, he was defining how people should relate to him. And so we have to grasp that his intent was to bless, not to punish. And so that, that whole idea just confirms, again, what we've been getting at in this series, that these are boundaries that we need. Right now, Exodus 23, 20 through 33, records the conclusion to this book of the covenant. And in it, the Lord promised the people of Israel three blessings if they obeyed his law. So we're going to work our way through those verses this morning. And as we do, um, because of where we stand in history, we can look back and see how Israel responded to the law and what was the result of that. But then we also have to ask, how do these, what application is there of these promises for us today as New Testament believers. So the first blessing that comes out in this passage is the blessing of protection. Right? In our world, it's really just the wealthy and the powerful who have guards to protect them. Everyday people don't have that. Right? Wherever the, the president of the United States goes, he's surrounded by secret service officers. They plot his course. They arrange his transportation. They prepare for any trouble that he might encounter. But those plans, those directions, those decisions are all at the direction of the president and his staff. Right? It's not like the guards decide where the president should go or what he should do or, or travel. That's not their role, right? But when we come to this passage, the Lord promised the people of Israel a very different kind of protection because, first of all, it wasn't just protection for Moses, it was protection for the entire nation. And they didn't tell their guardian what to do. They had to listen to him. So we read about it in these first few verses, verses 20 through 22. It tells us that the Lord said, Behold... I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. And then in verses 21 and 22, he says, Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression. For my name is in him. 
But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. So this is now the the third mention of an angel in the book of Exodus. And all three seem to refer to the same being. He first appeared in a burning bush back in Exodus chapter 3, calling Moses to return to Egypt and to, to lead the people of Israel out from their slavery to Pharaoh. And then, of course, when the people of Israel departed from Egypt, it identifies the angel with the pillar of cloud that led them and and then protected them from Pharaoh and his army as they pursued them by the waters of the Red Sea. And so now this same angel of the Lord would continue to guide them as a nation through the wilderness and into the promised land. Now, the the Hebrew word for for angel could, could simply refer to any messenger, it could refer to a human messenger, it's not necessarily an angelic being in the way that we think about it, but these passages make it clear that this being is not human, right? In fact, his authority transcends even that of other angelic beings that are described in the Bible. He doesn't just deliver a message from God, it says the name of the Lord is in him. And in this passage, his voice is really equated with the voice of the Lord. And it seems to suggest that he has the ability to forgive sin, though the Lord says that he will not do so if they disobey him, if they transgress. And so from a New Testament perspective, I think we have to say that this angel of the Lord seems to be the Son of God. Right? It's, it's Jesus prior to his incarnation appearing here. And so... Here, the Lord would so identify with the people of Israel that their enemies would be his enemies and their adversaries, his adversaries. Now, that statement there harkens back to uh, the part of the Lord's original covenant promise to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12. He told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I, I will curse. So we just have to say, first of all, that there's no greater security than having the Lord on your side, right? This was an amazing thing. But the key here is that to experience this amazing alliance, the people of Israel would need to obey, right? So how did they do with that? Well, you don't have to read far. You get to Exodus 32, And it tells us that within around 40 days, they were worshiping a golden calf, right? And Moses comes down the mountain and confronts their sin and calls them to repentance. About a year later, they set out from Sinai, and they almost immediately begin to complain about their food. The Lord ends up bringing a plague upon them. And then they they draw near to the the promised land. They send out the 12 spies to check out the area. And when they come back, the negative report from 10 of them makes the people of Israel so afraid that they refuse to trust the Lord to give them the victory. And the Lord sentences them to spend 40 years in the wilderness. But ironically enough, then they try to enter the land without the Lord's blessing, and they're defeated. So, so it just doesn't work out the way that this promise, right? They, I mean, they, they never live this out. They never follow uh, this standard of obedience. And so that generation ends up dying off in the wilderness. Now, the next generation that comes along, they do follow the angel of the Lord into the promised land, but then they have a whole set of other troubles that we'll talk about in a minute. So as New Testament believers then, we find ourselves in a very different situation from the people of, of Israel. I mean, they, and we've talked about this all the way through this series, they were a nation. They were gathered together, traveling to a physical destination. But the church, the New Testament church, is composed of people drawn from every 
nation, tribe, and tongue scattered around the world, waiting for Christ to return and reign. And yet, Jesus made a promise of protection for his followers that sounds very similar to what's recorded here in Exodus 23, 20. Look at these opening words from John 14, verses 1 through 3 tells us that Jesus told his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So, like Israel... We are heading toward a destination prepared by God. In fact, if you know that chapter, Jesus goes on in verse 6 to, to say that he himself is the way, right? The way, the truth, and the life. And that to draw near to God, they need to be cleansed of their sins through faith in his sacrificial death. So that unlike that angel in, in the Old Testament, Jesus is able to forgive our sins because of his saving work. And so in response, we should walk in, grat in grateful obedience. And Jesus, thankfully, doesn't leave us to work that all out on our own. He promised to send the Holy Spirit. If we skip down in that same chapter to verses 15 through 17, tells us, he said, if, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's the focus on obedience. And he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So in some ways, the indwelling Spirit is even better protection than an angel in a fiery cloud. Because no matter where you are, he's always present within every believer. And as Paul explains later in Galatians 5, that the Spirit works within us to lead us away from fleshly deeds and toward a fruitful life. Right? That's, that's, a, a, that's one of the great blessings of the, of the new covenant. In Ephesians 1.14, Paul says that the Spirit seals us and serves as the guarantee of our eternal inheritance. So with the Spirit's help, we can increasingly walk in obedience and experience the blessed assurance that comes from His protection. And that's the blessing of protection. The second blessing that we see in Exodus 23 is a blessing of provision. And of course, you know in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says that we should ask God to give us this day our daily bread. But I think, I think most of us probably don't approach life with quite that level of dependence. Right? Because, I mean, just practically, right? Your refrigerator and pantry might be full of food, right? you're probably not concerned about your daily bread. And, and then if it begins to run low, you go to the supermarket and find shelves stocked with an incredible variety of good things to eat. Of course, you have to pay money for those things, but we tend to think of money as something we earn by doing our jobs. And so if we're not careful, we can sort of forget all the ways that God is at work in that process that he's the creator of the earth and every edible thing in it. And that he controls the weather and he causes plants to grow, that he sustains the farmers and every worker in the whole supply chain that we hear so much about today. He sustains you. He gives you the strength to get up in the morning and, and to do work. But yet there's this temptation to ignore all of that, and to just trust in your own strength and ability. 
what the people of Israel, when they entered the promised land, they would be tempted similarly. They'd be inclined to ignore God and just you know, look at their own strength and ability, but, it, but they were also tempted to place their trust in the false gods worshipped by the nations there, gods of storms and fertility and And so they needed to remember that the Lord was the true source of all the provision they needed in their lives. And so in Exodus 23, uh, verses 23 through 24, the Lord tells them this. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I blot them out... You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do. But you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. Now elsewhere in the Old Testament, we find that that the Lord was planning to blot out these nations because of their wicked deeds. He was passing judgment upon them. Now he had already done so with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was around 500 years earlier during the time of Abraham. But he chose to wait, judging the other people throughout the land until Abraham's descendants had multiplied into a great nation. And so the Lord commanded the people of Israel to eliminate those false religions completely. And it mentions pillars there. Those might have been places of worship or memorials of some sort but they were all supposed to be destroyed. They're supposed to be eliminated. The entire land was to be devoted to the worship of the one true God. And he wanted them to remove anything that might tempt them to to trust someone other than him. Now, if they obeyed him in doing all that, he promised to provide for them abundantly. We move on to Exodus 23, verses 25 and 26. It tells us that he said, You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. So this blessing that God promised them extended far beyond just meeting their their basic needs. He says their, their water and bread would be blessed. That sickness would be taken away. That mothers would bear healthy children. That everyone's lives would be long. They would really prosper. And yet again, we look ahead and, and, and look at Old Testament history, and we find that they failed to obey. They didn't eliminate idolatry from the land as they were commanded. The people of Israel end up turning to false gods repeatedly. And so what happens? The Lord used times of drought and famine and sickness to to discipline them, to lead them to repentance. But we have to say they never experienced this blessing in full. Now, fast forward, we come to when Jesus came, he gave people glimpses of this blessing through his miracles, didn't he? Think about it. He he multiplied the loaves and fishes. He healed people of blindness, deafness, leprosy, other physical deformities. He even raised the dead. And yet, in the ministry of Jesus, he didn't provide food for all the hungry people in the world. He didn't heal everyone who was sick. He didn't raise everyone from the dead at that point. And so it's interesting. Sometimes you'll hear some Christians who claim that if you have enough faith, if you just obey the Lord, that you can personally experience the kind of health and prosperity promised in the Old Testament in passages like this one in Exodus 23. But that, that assertion is False. Those promises, we have to see, they were never given to individuals. They were given to the nation as a whole. Things like famine, sickness, infertility, they're all 
part of life. They're part of the suffering that we all encounter living in a fallen world. And so we have to see that these promises were how far-reaching they are. I think, I think Romans 8, 20 through 23 helps us sort this out. There Paul explains, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And then he says, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so I think we have to say for that promise back in Exodus 23, 25 through 26, to be ultimately fulfilled, right, it's pointing to the whole, that the whole physical world needs to be set free from the curse that's plagued it since the fall of man. And yet, when you follow Paul's logic here in Romans 8, that can't happen until the children of God are glorified, until our bodies are redeemed, because only then will we be able to fully obey God. It's what the Old Testament law was pointing toward all along. He called Israel to be a holy nation, and they couldn't do it. Right? They fell short because the law wasn't enough. They needed the atoning work of Christ that came later, and they needed the internal work of the Holy Spirit. And so like Paul says there, as New Testament believers, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. It's just the start of what God wants to do. We're, we're better able to obey, and yet we still struggle. We still continue to fall into sin. And so we await the day when this transforming work of the Spirit will be complete. Because when that happens, we'll experience God's provision of life in its fullest sense. And so in the meantime, we have to walk by faith. We have to trust God to use the suffering and trials that this life to prepare us for that ultimate prosperity of eternity in his presence. So protection, provision, and then the third blessing that we see in this passage is possession, possession of the land. I don't know about you, I can't tell the difference between hornets, or yellow jackets, or wasps. They all seem to be able to inflict pain, right? I mean, that's kind of my perspective. And I don't, personally, I don't worry that much about that, but boy, when my kids were growing up, they would see any insect flying toward them, they would get uh, nervous and begin to, you know, run away. And I think that ability that those creatures have to, to sting seems to be part of that curse uh, on our fallen world. And yet it's interesting, in Exodus 23, the Lord speaks of using hornets to bless the people of Israel, to help them take possession of the promised land. It's an interesting passage. Uh, verse, verses 27 through 30 tell us that the Lord said this, I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send, here it is, hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. And then he says this, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possess the land. Isn't that interesting? I mean, the Lord knew that just it would take time for Israel to take control of this 
territory. And so rather than wiping out all the inhabitants overnight, which, of course, he certainly could do, right? That was what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah. He wanted the people of Israel to gradually work their way through the land. And the Lord would ensure their victory, but they needed to trust him each step of the way. I mean, that strategy would, would test their faith. And like he says, it would keep the land from being overrun in the meantime. And when we move on to Exodus 23, 31, the Lord marks out the boundaries of the promised land for them by saying this, and I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. For I will give the inhabitants of the of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. Now, in Numbers 34, the Lord revealed a more exact description of, of, the, of the land. And when you compare it with the current boundaries in the Middle East, I mean, this, this plot of land extends beyond modern-day Israel. It includes part of Egypt, all of Lebanon, most of Syria, and so think about it, the Lord didn't give the people of Israel a quiet, out-of-the-way territory to possess, right? I mean, the control of this area has always been contested by different nations. With the desert to the east and the Mediterranean Sea to the west, I mean, this piece of land stands as, as a bridge between Africa and Europe and Asia. It's, it's it's really the center of the whole earth. It's the crossroads of the world. And that's the land he gave them. Right? It was that even that territory itself is a test of, of faith trying to live there. But for this promise to be fulfilled, again, they needed to obey the Lord. We continue on to Exodus 23, 32 through 33 tells us that the Lord said, you shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. So again, how did they do with that? Well, 500 years later, by the time of Solomon... Israel did come close to these boundaries, but the fact is they never had full control of the land like they were supposed to because they never drove out the nations. They compromised. They made covenants with them. They allowed those false religions to continue. And so here again, this promise has never really been fulfilled. And so when we look ahead to the prophets in the Old Testament, the prophet Zechariah foresaw a time when there would be a great battle that would take place around Israel's capital city, Jerusalem. He said that the Lord himself would fight against the nations and conquer them. Zechariah 14, 16 then tells us the outcome. It says, then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. So there would be this time of great victory, that this blessing would ultimately be fulfilled, and this seems to be the same battle described in Revelation 19. Verses 15 and 16 there, John describes the return of Christ by saying, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You keep reading in Revelation, you find out that Jesus' return initiates his millennial reign described in Revelation 20, and it leads ultimately to a new heaven and, and earth that talks about in Revelation 21 and 22. We talked about that last week. And so ultimately, he will take possession of the land that was promised to Israel. He will purge false religion from the world. And through his perfect obedience and his mighty power, he'll finally fulfill all the promises that were given 
to Israel. But what does all that have to do with with you and me? By the grace of God, we become heirs of that kingdom through faith in Christ. And so we can trust him to fight those future battles when he returns. Now, the church is never called to to claim territory or to fight physical battles. Our battle is a spiritual one. First, we we fight to overcome sin in our lives. I think Paul kind of hits at this mindset in 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, he says, For you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So as we await that kingdom, we should seek to live worthy lives. To begin to obey by the Spirit's help. And then the other component of, for us is that we proclaim the good news that sinners like us can receive an inheritance in his kingdom through faith in Christ. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, he says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so we must keep seeking the kingdom. We must bring every part of our lives under Christ's rule and show others the way. So the Lord promised Israel that if they obeyed, they'd experience these blessings, protection, provision, and possession of the land. But Old Testament history shows us that they failed. Because they're sinners as we all are. And yet when Jesus came, he fulfilled God's righteous demands. And so as those who believe in him, we come under his protection. We have the spirit to indwell us. We experience his provision as he grants us the hope of eternal life and then sustains us through the the difficulties of life here and now. And one day he will grant us that inheritance to possess in his kingdom. So are you following him? Do you relate to Christ as, as your king? If not, I invite you to bow before him today, to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And if you want to learn more about these blessings. I encourage you to set aside some time to to read through Romans chapter 8. Powerful lessons there. And if you're already following Christ, think about this. Do you need to change your approach, your whole mindset about obedience? Do you approach it, do you see it as a restriction, as a burden? or as a response to the promises of God's blessings, confident in his goodness. We need to walk worthy of his kingdom and glory. And so as you face temptations and the trials of life in this world, trust his goodness, trust his power. May we live for the honor and glory of our King.